Um, you, you bring up an interesting point when you're talking about today, uh, the, the absence of, of that learning process today, being on the road. You know what they do, um, they have these developmental territories that crop up now. Mm -hmm. But you're right, what is lost is that that journeyman experience, yes. working for the fans in Dallas and then working for the fans uh, maybe in San Francisco for a while and then going up to Portland and working for the fans. Mm -hmm. You learn the country, you learn the different uh, different, uh, right. different um, personalities of, of different areas and of the country. And you also learn different styles. Uh, like Texas was, was a hardcore, I guess you would call it, stiff. If you came to Texas and you were going to wrestle in Texas, you were going to make a name for yourself. You had to be able to take an ass whipping every night. Yeah. Loads of guys came through, and the biggest complaint I had, and they would say to me, God, do these guys have to kick so hard and hit so hard? I don't know if I can take it. And I would be very clear and say, hey, man, this is Texas wrestling. We beat the shit out of each other, and if you can't take it, it's best you leave now because it's not going to get any better. Yeah. There were other territories where guys would work extremely loose. If they wanted to pull your hair, they'd just lay their hand up there. Right. In Texas, you would grab a handful and pull the guy down. Right. If you would kick a guy in Texas, you would lay it in. And if you could leave boot laces, that was even better. No wrestler in Texas went to the ring without black and blue marks on his chest, his back. Right. It, was, it was very, very stiff. We called it snug. Other people called it stiff. Like I said, there were some areas where high spots or wood spots or whatever they call them. That was what the match was all about. But you try that in Texas, they boo you out of the ring. Right. They did. We had guys like Johnny Valentine, Fritz von Erich, Don Jardine the spoiler, mm -hmm. Wahoo McDaniel. I yeah. mean, he would beat you to death. And if you couldn't take it, you didn't work with Wahoo, but you lost a lot of money. Right. Yeah. Um, speaking of Texas, um, how was that territory defined boundary-wise? Because, you know, you had the Blanchard and San Antonio and stuff. So, uh, specific to Fritz, uh, what was the Dallas See, territory? There's a, there's a big misconception on that. Paul Bosch had one town. Joe Blanchard had two towns. They had no talent. The booking office controlled the talent, so therefore we controlled the promoters. We had anywhere between 16 and 18 guys in our booking office in Dallas while I was the booker. I didn't want to keep more than that because I, if I had 20, 22, uh, some guys would be off. Right. And I tried to keep it anywhere between six, 14 and 16 guys. Now, without the Dallas booking office, Joe Blanchard, where could he get his talent? Would he fly everyone in from Bill Watts? Would he fly everyone in from Vince? Right. The same thing with Paul Pye. So that's a misconception that it was Dallas was just a little place here that Paul and Joe were separate. They weren't. Without the talent from the Dallas booking office, they had no talent. Mm -hmm. If if I would say to Joe one day, look, Joe, uh, we no longer interested in booking your town because it's not profitable for us. Where would Joe go? Would mm -hmm. he go to L.A. to Mike LaBelle? and fly in 12 guys? Would he go to Bill Watts and fly in 12 of Bill's guys? And do you think that Bill would allow them to use his talent anywhere, any way they wanted to? That mm. was my big problem. Two big problems in Texas in the booking office. Paul Bosch liked to use world's champions. He didn't care if it was AWA, WWE, or NWA. And that was constant problems for me as the matchmaker mm. because I was a matchmaker for the National Wrestling Alliance. And every time he'd bring in Bruno or he'd bring in Nick Bockwinkle, I would catch hell from half the alliance. Gary, you got to stop doing this. But I was under a situation where I was booking Paul's towns and he was paying us 40% of the gross. The same thing with Joe Blanchard. So I had to allow them the freedom to bring people in occasionally. Mm -hmm. But it's a misconception that Joe had a separate territory and Paul had a separate territory. No, Paul did not have any wrestlers that he employed. Huh. Joe Blanchard had no wrestlers he employed. All the wrestlers, if you wanted to come and wrestle in Texas, you called the Dallas booking office, you talked to Danny Pletches before me and Red Bastien before me. But as of uh, 1976 until 1982, 
I was the guy. If you were going to come to Texas and work for Paul mm -hmm. or Joe, you came through me. That's interesting. If I, I didn't want to use you, then Paul didn't have a chance to use you. But it's a big misconception, like it was three little little different territories. It wasn't. Right. There was Houston, right. San Antonio, Corpus, Dallas, Fort Worth, and then spot shows. But every piece of talent, the bulk of the card came from my office, and I ran the show. I did what I wanted mm -hmm. to do because you got to remember, I had to keep my talent happy mm -hmm. or they would leave. So I couldn't allow Joe Blanchard nor Paul Bice mm -hmm. to just use my talent any way I could. Sure, you of just course. can't do that. And that is a big misconception. Another thing people don't understand, not only did we have Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, Corpus Christi, and Houston, we had Amarillo, we had Lubbock, we had Abilene, we had San Angelo, we had El Paso, we had Lawton, Oklahoma. We, we had about 32 towns. But, you know, revisionist history yeah. goes around. And uh, most of the things that you hear about world class is not necessarily true. There was one power in Texas that was Fritz von Erich and who his booker was. Paul could not live without him. Joe could not live without him. A fact. Joe broke away in 79. He died a horrible death. Paul Bosch, one of the greatest promoters ever in wrestling, broke away in 79. He went a couple of years with Bill Watts, couldn't get along with Bill Watts. He went with Joe Blanchard, couldn't get along with Joe Blanchard. Mm. He went with Vince McMahon, he couldn't get along with Vince McMahon. So by 1982, in two years after running a successful promotion for over 30 years, without the talent and the direction of the Dallas booking office, not only did Joe Blanchard go out of business, Paul Bysh went out of business. Mm. So that is a bit of history that is factual but not really mentioned. Joe Blanchard was the first guy that had USA TV, long before Vince. And he blew it. Yeah. He lost the TV. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of this thing about Texas and Paul and Joe, and it was separate but equal, that's not Yeah, true. I mean, that's that's just what you hear. You know, every city gets a stamp. You know, Dallas, yeah. the, the Dallas office, the, the, the yeah. San Antonio, Houston, yeah, but they separate territories. Yeah, but this but is very Dallas was the booking office. Right, sure. Yeah, I understand. And no one, you could not work in San Antonio or Houston unless you worked for the booking office out of Dallas. Right. Now, say you're Nick Bockwinkle. Paul could bring you in, we allowed that. Say if you're Bruno Sermatino, Dusty Rhodes, Ivan Koloff, we would allow that, one or two, to keep him happy. Mm -hmm. But you've got to remember, every time these two guys would bring someone in, it would mean knock one of my boys out of a night's work. Right. People don't remember that. They just remember, well, yeah, Paul was this and Paul. And Paul was a great promoter. Mm -hmm. Joe Blanchard was shits. <laughs> he had no idea, no concept of anything. His greatest fame was he was a commentator for Jim Barnett when he was Jim's TV uh, announcer. Right. And Joe would have never had that position in Florida, in, in Texas, in San Antonio. Fritz von Erich put him in there because Fritz and Joe were buddies. Oh. I was in the meeting the day that Fritz von Erich told Dorothy Brown and Frank Livinggood, meet your new partner, Joe Blanchard, and they balked. We don't need a new partner. Well, he's your partner. Mm. That's how Joe got in. Huh. Paul got in because he was Morris Siegel's front office man, mm -hmm. and Morris Siegel had a series of heart attacks, and he died, and Paul took over. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, Fritz and Ed McLemore took the booking office from Houston because the guys that were in the book was working for Paul and Morris. When Morris died, they said, we got to get out of here. You know, we, can't, we can't trust anyone else. Mm -hmm. So that's when Fritz and Ed McLemore made the move and took the booking office to Dallas. And that's another reason mm. that Paul Bosch and Fritz always had problems because Paul felt that his whole life he had worked for Morris, Morris had the booking office, Morris dies, Fritz and Ed McLemore take the booking office, Paul ended up with one town. Now if you have a booking office, you could card into the amount of money drawn per week, you get like Houston, we got 40%. Mm -hmm. uh, say uh, San Antonio, we got 40%. West Texas with the funks, mm -hmm. we would only get 30 Because when you get smaller arenas and smaller venues, you got to allow them to get a little more money. Get money sure. But Dallas, Texas, Fritz von Erich, 
was the power in Texas. Mm -hmm. These other guys were his associates, and without him, they could not live. Now, working a territory system specific to Dallas, uh, you guys are doing a loop of, of, uh, of cities uh, over a period of time, uh, mm -hmm. a week, two weeks, whatever, hitting, hitting the same cities. Um, what did you travel with? Did you travel with the ring? Did you travel with, or, or, or were, that, were, no. the, were they at the venues, the individual no, venues? No, each town, Paul Bosch, Sam Houston Coliseum, uh -huh. he had his own ring. Okay. Uh, Joe Blanchard, uh, the Hemisphere, or the Joe at Harry, had its own ring. Uh, say a town like Carpus, it had its own ring. Okay. Uh, every, uh, every city that we ran, we ran in the biggest available building, and uh, it was a ring stored there. Okay. How did we travel? We were very lucky. There's a thing called Southwest Airlines, mm -hmm. and we could fly at very reasonable prices. Like, you could fly to Houston round trip, $36. Mm -hmm. You could go to probably Amarillo for 45 So we were traveling by plane long before most wrestlers because mm -hmm. of Southwest Airlines and Braniff. They were local companies that uh, provided very, very cheap fares and you could fly into say like Houston and catch the last plane out at midnight or you could fly to San Antonio catch the last plane out 10 30 11 o'clock mm. so it was it was a wonderful way to do things I mean it, you didn't have the I always hear oh you go to Texas you drive 10,000 miles well I never did and I was in Texas for 20 years mm. and if I was going to San Antonio I would fly if I was going to Carpus I would fly Amarillo, Lubbock, Midland, Odessa, El Paso I flew at my own expense, mm -hmm. at my own expense, but it was so reasonable, right. I mean, to drive your car and tear up your car and sure. worry about fans cutting your tires and breaking your windows, take a cab in, you take a cab out. So right. every promoter had his own TV, like Paul Bice. Mm -hmm. He had his own TV station, he had his own truck that would come to the arena and tape it. Joe Blanchard had a TV station that provided him with a truck. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I provided, and well, Fritz and I, was talent. I would come in, I would book your show for you with you helping. You know, if you wanted something special, I'd say, sure, fine, no mm -hmm. problem with me. Then the night of the show, I would show up uh, that afternoon. I would go over your TV with you, see uh, what direction you wanted to go. And then I would run their shows for them as, uh, as their matchmaker. So let's talk about TV for a minute. As a book.